with Jesus and what he's done for us. Yeah. Man, he is king. He is still on the throne. He is alive. He has, he has freed all of us because of his love and because of his sacrifice on the cross. Can I pray for us this morning? Father, we thank you, God, for your sacrifice. We thank you that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to a cross so that we could have freedom through him. God, we love you. Receive our praise this morning. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. How we doing, Northwest Campus? Man, like I said earlier, it is great to see you guys. We are honored you're here with us. And if you're a guest with us, man, welcome to Trader's Point. Uh, I, I say this a lot. Well, you hear us say this a lot. There's a place called Connection Central. If you have any questions, now listen. Listen, guests, they're really nice. The people back there, they're really nice, I promise, all right? They have orange shirts on. They would love to meet you, get to know your name. So if you have any questions about anything going on here at church, man, make sure you stop by there, okay? Awesome. Well, we're in week number four of our series, Growth Track, all right? It's been an amazing month, and we've been talking about this a lot, too. So we got these cards we're going to have you fill out. And guys, listen, the why behind it is very simple. We need to track and make sure we are getting you guys connected, see where we're at on getting you connected and growing. So please fill out the entire card. Every single week you've been coming, we've been telling you that. So this week is no exception. Fill out the entire card and drop it on, in the white boxes on your way out today. Aaron will be talking about it in his message. And even if you're a guest, fill that card out. We would love to. We would love to know how we're doing with that, okay? Awesome. Grab a card, nudge your neighbor, say hey. You guys can find your seat, all right? Well, we are in our fourth and final week of this uh, series that we have been in all month long called Growth Track. And the big idea behind it is that we just want to help you uh, figure out what the next step is towards greater connection and spiritual growth. And so right now I just want to look right into the camera and greet all of you, whether you're joining us from our North Campus, Downtown West, online, those of you at Northwest, because you look at me on the screens anyway, just want to say... Hello to all of you. It's good to have you today. And uh, as we uh, kind of roll out week number four, here's the question that I just want you to consider of yourself today. Have you ever been faced with, with something in your life that you felt totally unqualified to do? Anybody? All right. Anybody like get married, don't feel qualified to be married? Like, I don't know that I have the skill set for that. You you bring a child into the world. I don't know if I have what it takes to be a parent. You start a new job. I don't know if I have what it takes. You're a new student on a new campus. You just feel unqualified to do this. You feel uh, out of your league, in over your head, whatever kind of phrase you want to use to describe. I just don't know that I have what it takes to do this thing. If that's you, and if you're honest, that should be every single one of us, then you're in good company. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, there have been uh, a number of uh, times in my life when I felt that way, when I just feel like unqualified for the task that's in front of me. Maybe the most memorable, though, was uh, years ago when, when uh, my wife Lindsay and I were dating. She has two younger sisters, so her middle sister uh, was a big soccer player. And it was her senior year of high school. She's getting ready to start uh, varsity soccer, and their soccer coach quit a week before the, se the uh, season started. And so she, I was over at their house and she was complaining about it. She said, we don't have a coach and if we don't have a coach, then they're not going to have the season. And she looked at me and I, she gave me this look. You know the look? Like, say, you're stupid enough. Like, <laughs> like you, 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 you played soccer in high school, didn't you, Aaron? And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. There's a difference between playing and coaching. There's a difference between, you know, being on the field and actually being on the sidelines coaching, as, let alone teenage girls. All right? I just don't know what I'm doing. And I said, no, no way am I doing that. And uh, she wasn't very happy. The next day, the athletic director called me and said, hey, we got your name and number from someone. <laughs> I was like, I wonder who. And they said, we were wondering if you'd be willing to kind of just 
you know, pinch hit and step in as an interim volunteer. We, we're, we're actively searching for a full-time soccer coach. We think we'll find one with just in two or three weeks. So it's just a couple weeks of practice, maybe one or two games at best. I became the girls' soccer coach that whole season long, right? And it was like, I remember like, I was trying to decide whether or not I should do it. And my soon-to-be sister-in-law, she would like begged me. And she's like, Aaron, please, if you don't step up and actually um, volunteer for this, then they're going to cancel the soccer season of my senior year in high school, which is then going to ruin my senior year of high school, which is then going to ruin my life. And I'm going to be prone to depression and heartache and dysfunction for the rest of my days. And I was like, all right. You know, I felt my, my she was twisting my arm to do it. And um, we lost every single game that season, all right? And it's not because of the girls, it's because of me, right? And my inability to coach. And in fact, every now and then I'll have somebody say, you know, what prepared you to do what you're doing today to be a pastor of, of this church? I'm like that, right? That's, that's one of those experiences. And I think that uh, whenever, this is what we want to talk about today is that when you look at the pages of Scripture, here's one of the interesting qualities about God. God never asked anybody to do anything that they felt qualified to do. Not once. Not, not once did God actually come to somebody and say, hey, I want you to do this task. And they stepped forward and said, well, I feel totally qualified to do that. In fact, it's always the opposite. And there's a very specific reason why God calls the unqualified to do what only he can do in and through them. That's what we want to talk about today. And so if you have a Bible or a Bible app, go ahead and turn to or power up your Bible and get to Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we have been in this series called Growth Track, and just real quickly, because it's our final week, let me just kind of walk you through each of the steps of Growth Track. We started with just this idea of we want you to start following Jesus. And so I'm not going to assume that everybody's in the same place spiritually. Maybe you come from a different church background. Maybe you have a church background. Maybe you don't. We just want to help you to start following Jesus. And then week two is we want you to connect you with other people and get in a circle. We learn in rows, but we grow in circles. And then last week is we want you to grow in your faith through that group and through daily personal spiritual disciplines. And then this week is go. Go discover your purpose. Join a team and make a difference. And in October, we'll begin running growth track classes at all of our campuses on Sundays. It'll just be a place for people to go and to know that's where they can take their next step, wherever they may be. And so if you have been here for all four weeks of this series, if you've engaged with us by filling out that card, then there's no need for you to go through the class again because we're going through it as a church together. And listen, all this is, is a tool for to us to, to help you take your next step. That's all it is. And we're actually seeing some pretty amazing results because on week number one, uh, we saw 140 baptisms. We've got roughly another 60 or so today at all of our campuses. So about 200 baptisms for the month. And then on week two, I just challenged you to get into a circle and nearly 2,000 of you said that you wanted to get into a group. And so we're still following up with you. A little more than half of you have been followed up with. So if you haven't yet, thank you for your patience. It takes a lot of time and energy to focus up or follow up with 2,000 people. And we're out of leaders. So last week I just said, would you please volunteer to be trained as a leader so we can get people in groups? And about 50 of you uh, stepped forward and said you'd be willing to be trained as a leader. So thank you for that. And then here's another thing to celebrate is that last week, 844 of you said that you would start tithing. You said, I'm going to try the tithe. I think that's incredible. That's amazing. That many of you would trust God in that area. And now this week is we want to talk about um, God working in and through you to make a difference in the lives of other people. And I think that when it comes to, to serving others or when it comes to stepping forward and figuring out what our purpose is and how God might want to use us, I think that most of us um, understand the importance of it. But there's maybe a number of things that cause us to be hesitant to be used by God in that way or to maybe be a bit reluctant. And that's what we see in Exodus chapter 3. We see an, an example of a conversation uh, between God and an unlikely leader by the name of Moses. And God is asking Moses to do something that Moses was not qualified to do. And God was asking him to lead. And I think that maybe Moses' hesitation was rooted in the fact that when he thought about a leader, there was a picture that he had that came to his mind, and he didn't match that picture. 
And I think for many of us, when we think about leadership, there's maybe a number of you in the room. I would guess it's a smaller percentage of you that would actually see yourself as a leader. But for the vast majority of us, when you, when you think about a leader, you're like, I'm not a leader because a leader is somebody who has all the answers. Or a leader is somebody who knows what to do next. Or a leader is somebody that stays cool, calm, and collected under pressure. And I don't think that I'm a leader. But God's definition and description of a leader is far more easily to attain than what we may give it. God's definition of a leader is anyone who makes themselves available for God to use. Anyone who steps up to make a difference. And so God comes to Moses and he says, Moses, I want to use you as a leader. And, and Moses is really hesitant because he doesn't feel qualified. And so look at this conversation. It begins in, in verse 7. It says, Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. He's talking about the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. And God says, I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. So up to this point, sounds like God's got it covered. Sounds like God knows what the problem is. Sounds like God is saying, I'm the one that's going to step up and lead them out. And he goes, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites now live. And then he says, look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now, here is where God's going to throw Moses a curveball. In verse 10, he says, now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh you must lead my people out, my people Israel out of Egypt. And to that, I'm sure that Moses is like, wait a second, I thought you had this covered. You were the one that seemed like you knew what you were going to do. You were going to lead them out. Why are you involving me in this? And one of the amazing qualities about God is that God always involves imperfect people like you and me to do what he is doing in and around the world. God is about the furthest thing from a control freak that you can get. And God has every right to be a control freak. God, God could say to us, just, just move. Don't make a mess. Go sit down in the corner. Please not, don't try to complicate what I'm trying to do around the world. But instead, God takes the exact opposite posture. And God says, no, actually, I want to involve you in what I'm doing in and through the world, even if you mess it up. And we will. God says, I want to equip you. I want to empower you. I want to do something in and through you to affect the lives of other people. I want to ask you to do something that you don't feel qualified to do. And here was Moses' response. Maybe this is your response as well. I know it's been my response at times. Moses <laughs> protested to God. He argued with him. By the way, you never win. He protested to God and he said, who am I? to appear before Pharaoh. And he says it again. Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, God, what makes you think that I can do this? I don't have the skill set. I don't have the qualifications. I don't have the degree. I don't have the experience to do what it is that you are asking me to do. And has anybody ever been in that situation. And even if you would not call yourself a follower of Jesus, you can probably relate to that where maybe you've been faced with a responsibility, a request uh, that somebody's asking you to do. And you're like, I don't know that I have what it takes to do this. And here was God's response to Moses. God says, God answers him. He says, well, I will be with you. Of all the things that God could have said to him, God could have said, well, you're being too hard on yourself. Actually, you're a lot better than that. God could have said, Moses, man, you, you've been given so many gifts and you just need to leverage those. No, God doesn't say any of that. God says, I will be with you. In other words, here's what God's saying. God is saying, what makes you think this has anything to do with you? What, what makes you think that, that you are actually the X factor in all of this? Moses, you're actually, this actually looks like humility, Moses. This is actually rooted in the same thing that our pride comes out of. You're thinking about yourself too much. It isn't about what you can do. It's about what I can do through you. Yeah. 
It isn't about what you bring to the table. It's about what I want to actually do in your life and through your life. Listen, if you could do this on your own, then it wouldn't be that spectacular. It would just be an ordinary day. And God actually specializes in doing extraordinary things through ordinary people like you and me. God does amazing things through average days. He says, Moses, I just wanted you to be available to me. But Moses is like so many of us. He just doesn't see it yet. And so he protests again. And his, his first objection was sort of inward focus. His next objection is outward focus. He goes, well, what if they... What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? This is like the fear of man, right? This is the fear of criticism. This is the fear of people thinking, well, I, don't, I think you're a fraud. I don't think you can do it. And I love this. You can read this for yourself from verses 2 to 9. God's like, okay, I'll tell you what to do if people don't believe you. Moses, you see that staff that's in your hand? He goes, yeah, throw it on the ground. Throws it on the ground. Turns into a snake. That's pretty amazing. He goes, now pick up the snake again which I would have never done, but Moses does. And he reaches down, he picks up the snake, turns back into a staff. And he goes, Moses, you see your perfectly healthy hand? He goes, yeah. He goes, stick it in your coat pocket. He does. Pull it out, pulls it out. It's covered in leprosy. He goes, stick it back in your pocket, which I totally would have done. <laughs> Sticks it back in his pocket and he pulls it back out again and it's healed. And God goes, if, if people don't believe you, just do those tricks. <laughs> just, just, show, just show them those two things. That'll, that'll, that'll prove to them that you've actually been with me. So Moses then goes from protesting to pleading in verse 10. And he says, he pleads with the Lord. He says, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I, in other words, he's assuming that a leader needs to be eloquent in speech. He goes, I have never been and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tied tongued Just seeing if you're with me, all right. <laughs> and my words get all tangled up. They just get jumbled. And God says to him in verse 11, he goes, well, I made your mouth. And once again, I'll be with you. And then Moses pleaded again. I love this. This is my favorite one. Oh, Lord, please just send someone else. I don't want to do it. I'm out of excuses, and so I just don't want to do it. And then God's response to him is he says, well, you don't need to go alone. You actually have a brother. His name is Aaron. And Aaron is actually gifted in ways that you are not. And you're gifted in ways that Aaron isn't. And so why don't you guys come together as a, as a team, as, as partners, and why don't you go together? And Moses, to his credit, he obeys God and he goes and he walks up to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. God uses him in incredible ways and it wasn't an easy road, but God actually takes Moses' availability and he does something really extraordinary in and through him. And God was asking Moses to be a leader and Moses just didn't see it. And I actually think that's one of the greatest qualifications for his leadership is that he didn't see it. I mean, if Moses would have been really quick, if, if God would have said, Moses, I want to ask you to go to Pharaoh and free my people, the Israelites, and he would have said, it's about time you recognize my leadership qualities, that would have immediately disqualified him. But the fact that Moses just didn't see it, I think was one of the primary things that God said, that, that's a heart that I can use. See, I want to give you this definition of a leader that makes it as accessible as, as possible. Here's how God sees leaders, is that a leader is anyone who steps up to make a difference. A leader is anybody who just says, God, here I am, use me. God, would you please take my ordinary, it isn't much, but it's all I got. And God says, that's all, that's all I need. I just need your ordinary and watch me do extraordinary things through the ordinary things that you make available to me. See, if we were to walk back through this passage and if we were to give labels to some of Moses' objections, you might be able to relate to one or all of these. I know that I can. The first one is just simply this. Moses was saying, well, who am I? I can't be used by God. Who am I? This is really a question of insecurity. Moses was insecure about his abilities. And he was also, I think, fearful of maybe some of the things going on in his past. So here's what Moses wasn't good at. And here's what Moses was ashamed of. Moses had some kind of a speech impediment. That's about all we know. He, 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 he stuttered. He couldn't talk very clearly. And he felt like if, if I'm going to be used in this way, then I've got to be really, really good at public speaking. The second thing is that Moses had something in his past that he didn't want everybody to know about. In fact, if you know anything about Moses' upbringing, he was an Israelite and Pharaoh had issued this decree to, to kill and murder all of the, the infant boys. And so Moses' mom put him in a basket, set him in the Nile River, flo he floated down the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter finds him. She adopts him as her own son, which is just totally ironic. And God takes him and he, he, he um, places him in Egypt where Moses has an upbringing as an Egyptian. 
But when he becomes older, he realizes his history. He realizes who he is. And he sees an Israelite, somebody that is of his people, being mistreated by an Egyptian. And Moses loses it. He's got a temper. If you remember the first time he came down Mount Sinai with the stone tablets and he saw what the people were doing, worshiping the golden calf, what did he do? He threw them down and they shattered. It's like, sorry, God, I know you worked hard on those. Like, he messed it up, right? The same temper caused him to actually murder this Egyptian. And Moses is ashamed of it. He goes, God, who am I? Man, people are going to find out about that. That disqualifies me. I'm not very good at what I do. And my guess is that maybe for you, the thing that's actually causing you to be hesitant to actually discover your purpose or what it is that God has called you to do is you focus on what you're not good at and maybe you focus on your past failures. And you disqualify yourself before God can ever use you. And God actually specializes in taking what you're not good at and working in and through that so that actually it shows you and others the power of God. When I look at what I'm doing today, it is laughable to me. Because I grew up hating public speaking. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. He laughs at me every single week. And when I say I hated public speaking, like I'm saying that my youth pastor used to drag me up in front of the youth group just to force me to pray in front of the group. I didn't want to do it. I got, literally got C's and D's in my high school speech classes. I hated public speaking. And in fact, uh, periodically people say, do you get nervous ever before you speak? And I'm like, every single time. Because this isn't like I just had like this natural ability to do this. And whoa, let, you know, I could be a car salesman or a preacher. I'll just, you know, I'll just go do this. No, God actually says, hey, where are you weak? And actually, hey, let's focus on that. You want to know how scripture says it? It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It says, my grace is all you need for my power works best in weakness. Did you hear that? My power works, whatever you think you're weak in, God says, good, let's, let's focus on that. Because my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Listen, God will put you in a situation where you have to face your insecurities so that you can feel the power of his presence all the more. Well, the next objection that Moses has is he says, well, what if they, and this is an issue of fear. He's like, well, what if, what will people think? What if they criticize me? What if they talk behind my back? And I know that maybe some of us, we never step up to, to do, to make ourselves available because we're fearful that we might get criticized or we might face some kind of resistance. But that's just, that just comes with the territory. Dr. Samuel Chan, in his book, Leadership Pain, which is a book I highly recommend, he says this. He says, all leadership is a magnet for pain, which comes in many forms. We catch flack for bad decisions because people blame us, and we get criticism even for good decisions because we've changed the status quo. When people suffer a crisis, we care deeply for them instead of giving them simplistic answers. We carry their burden, which means at least some of the weight of their loss and heartache falls on us. We suffer when our plans don't materialize or our efforts fail. And we face unexpected new challenges when our plans succeed and we experience a spurt of growth. Along the way, we aren't immune to the ravages of betrayal by those we trusted, the envy of our friends, and burnout because we're simply exhausted from all the struggles of leading people. And Dr. Chand actually says in that book, he goes, if you want to lead effectively, then just increase your threshold of pain because if you're not in pain, you're not leading. And some of us, maybe there was a time in your life when you actually said, no, I, I, Aaron, I remember, I remember, I served, I served one time in church or maybe I stepped up and I took a risk and I got hurt, I got burned, I got criticized and you know what, never again. And maybe for some of you, you went limping off of the field and you sat down on the bench and you've never gotten back in the game because you got hurt. And it happens a lot in the church. I remember years ago when I was contemplating going into ministry, I was talking to a mentor of mine and I was like, yeah, I feel like God's leading me into full-time ministry. I was a full of optimism. I was all excited. And he looked at me and he goes, man, I think that's great. He goes, but Aaron, you're going to need, you're going to need to ask for three things if you're going to go the distance. And I was like, what are they? And he goes, you're going to need to develop the courage of a lion because you're going to have to make difficult decisions at times. It's gonna, and you're, you're not going to have all the information. You've got to be courageous. But you've also got to develop the skin of a rhino because people are going to shoot at you. And then you've got to develop the heart of a teddy bear. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, you got to keep your heart soft towards people. 
You've got to have the courage of a lion. You've got to develop the skin of a rhino. And you've got to develop the heart of a teddy bear. Why? Because people are mean. <laughs> and they're messy. And if anybody steps up to say, hey, I'll be used of God in a significant way, if you are willing to take that risk, then you're actually placing yourself in oncoming traffic. And God says, no, 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 I need, I need you to be courageous, but I also need you to develop a thick skin because you're going to take lots and lots of arrows. Moses certainly did. But don't let the wounds that are inflicted from others cause you to grow bitter and cynical towards others. Keep a soft heart. Moses' next objection was just simply this one. He goes, well, I have never... I've never done this, God. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in over my head. And this is an issue of inadequacy. And once again, God will often ask you to do something that you've never done or you don't think that you're very good at to keep you dependent up only upon what he can do. You know, uh, 11 years ago, I was 31 years old and uh, I, I was facing the uh, opportunity to maybe come and serve this church as, as a pastor. And I remember Lindsay and I were praying through it and I was trying to seek lots and lots of counsel. I was 31 years old at the time and um, the pastor who served here before me, uh, his name is Howard Bramer. He served here for 24 years and he was a wonderful man, did an incredible job. And I was always, we can give him, give it up for Howard. And I was always given this counsel by people older than me. They said, Aaron, if you ever get the opportunity to follow a long tenured, well-loved pastor, don't. <laughs> because you'll never live up to people's expectations and they'll compare you to him and and they won't like what you change and and uh and it scared me and I remember like there was a bit of an age difference between me and Howard I was young the, the biggest church that I'd ever pastored up to that point was 180 people and Traders Point was about 1600 people at the time it was a huge jump and so I remember just seeking advice and counsel from as many people as I could I'll never forget calling one of my mentors who'd known me since I was a little kid and uh, I called him up and I said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm praying through this decision and I just need you to be honest with me. I don't need you to be nice to me right now. I need the truth. Don't sugarcoat it. You know me better than anybody. Do you think that I am too young and inexperienced to become the lead pastor at Traders Point? And I'll never forget his answer because he didn't even like stop to think. It was just like immediately out of his mouth. He goes, of course, you are too young and inexperienced to go serve at Traders Point. I was like, you didn't even have to think about that. Right? It's just like... It's like, thank you for that encouragement. And it was like kind of silent on the other end of the line. That's like all he said. I was like, is there a yeah, but? Is there, you know what? And after like several awkward seconds of silent, I'll never forget what he said to me next. He goes, but Aaron, actually look at the pages of scripture and everybody that God used was either too young or too inexperienced. And, and look at history. The people that create a lot of change oftentimes were too young and too inexperienced. And then he said this, I'll never forget it. He goes, if God calls you to it, he'll qualify you for it. And the exact same thing is true for your life. If God calls you to it, he will qualify you for it. And many times we feel like we need to flip these. Well, let me get qualified for it. And then if God calls me to it, I'll be ready. But God actually says, no, would you be willing to take a step of faith and let me qualify you as you go? And so God says to Moses, oh, you, you have a speech impediment and you've got this massive failure in your past. You're perfect. I'll use you as a leader. God says to this guy named Paul who actually murdered Christians, oh, you're perfect. I'll use you to write most of the New Testament. God says to a young, unwed teenage girl, or you, you're not ready to be a mom, you're perfect. I'll actually use you to be the mother of the son of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. He says to a, a Samaritan woman at a well, you've got five failed marriages, you are perfect. Just let the power of God come into your life. I'll actually use you to be a missionary in your hometown. And God is not nearly as interested in your ability as he is in your availability. And so Moses is out of excuses. And so the last one that he uses is just simply this one. He says, God, just please use someone else. It's just, just an issue of reluctance. And what this looks like is when you feel compelled or called by God to do something and you keep putting it off and you say, I'm too busy, I'm not ready, maybe in a different season of life, you know, whenever things settle down, but you'll never find the perfect season of life. And your spiritual growth will only go so far 
if you remain inward focused. There comes a time in each, in each one of our journeys as we're walking along with Jesus where God says, I need you to get externally focused. Like you've been spending a lot of time focusing upon your own growth and upon your own problems, upon your own issues. And actually, you've, you've, and it's not that that's bad. It's just that it's only going to take you so far and you're actually going to need to begin to, to look up and to get externally focused and that will unlock your spiritual growth. Why does God invite us into what he is doing in and around the world? Well, Moses was totally focused upon his, his problems, the things that, was, that were maybe causing him to say, I'm not qualified for this. And God wanted him to focus on his purpose. And I said this last week, is that we can either live our lives just totally trying to eliminate problems, which is not a bad thing to do. I mean, you should try to work on your problems. But if that's where you spend all your time, Problems are like weeds. They just keep coming back up. And what will happen is it will be a sad day when you get to the end of your life and realize all I did was try to eliminate and manage problems and you never went after your purpose. And what ends up happening is when you go after your purpose, when you go after what it is that God has called you to do, it's not that your problems go away. It's just that they get smaller. And God says to us in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, he says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. So use them well to do what? To serve one another. That's like, okay, I'm going to pull my head up and stop looking at my own life. I'm going to look at the lives of others. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies, then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. So why should we serve? Well, you serve not just to, to fill an empty role or to perform a function, but you actually serve so that you can show others the goodness of God. It says this in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, for you are a chosen people, you are royal priests, you're a holy nation, God's very own possession, and as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. So what that's saying there is that you're not just directing traffic out in the parking lot. You are showing others the goodness of God by the way in which you serve. That you're not just watching kids in kids' ministry. You're actually showing them the goodness of God by the way that you're impacting their lives. You're not just greeting people at a door. You're showing others the goodness of God. You're not just picking up trash in the hallway or in the bathroom. You're actually showing others the goodness of God by the way in which you serve. So let me just get like real honest with you. When it comes to your experience with a church, whether it's this one or another one, eventually there will come a day when the honeymoon period will, will wear off. And what I mean by that, maybe some of you are here, you're brand new to the church, and you think this is just the greatest church ever. And I would say, just give it a year <laughs> or less, all right? And eventually what will happen is maybe uh, the newness wears off, maybe something changes, wh whatever it could be. Maybe you get bored, you get distracted, life throws a curveball. Our church is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And if you, you'll come to this place eventually, speaking as a person who's been in church my whole life, where you just sort of feel like in the spiritual doldrums, you know? It's just like, I'm just in a valley. I just can't get out of it. I just feel sort of plateaued. I don't feel like God's doing anything else in my life. And for many of us, what will end up happening is we think, well, maybe the church is the problem. I need to bounce to another church. And maybe so. God not only calls people to churches, he calls them through them. But before you bounce to another church, why don't you say, you know what, God, maybe what needs to happen is I've been so focused on my own needs. Let me get externally focused and focus on the needs of others and just, just take a lap with that and see what God might do. I, I heard about this uh, young lady this last week. Um, she attends one of our campuses and she's new to our church. She uh, got baptized on week one of growth track. So everything is brand new to her. And she was on Facebook and she noticed uh, a post come through her feed from somebody that she didn't know. Uh, and this lady was saying, uh, our family is looking for a church to go to. Does anybody have any recommendations? And so she invited them. She doesn't know them. Imagine that. She's friends with somebody on Facebook. She doesn't know them. <laughs> and she goes, she, she said, hey, you can, come, you can come with me to my church. And she goes, oh, that's great. Well, you know, what service? They set up all the times. They're communicating back and forth. She never met them before. So she shows up at the campus. This is last weekend. And she's in the lobby. She's waiting for this lady and her family to come. And all she has to go on is the lady's Facebook profile picture. And so she's looking around, you know, for and the service is getting ready to start. And so she goes into the auditorium and she walks up to the, to the greeter and she says, she shows her the 
the profile picture, she says, if this lady and her family comes in, I'm sitting right down here, just bring them down and, and sit them next to me. And so she goes down and sure enough, a few minutes later, uh, the greeter comes down and seats this family and this, this lady and her family next to, to, next to her. And she said she experienced the service totally different because she had invited somebody to come. And so she was like wanting them to, to be moved by it. She was hoping that the message would be applicable. To, all, the, all those things. She wasn't totally focused on herself. And when she gets done, she looks at the lady. The lady says, hey, thanks so much for inviting us. And she said, well, she said, you know, if you want to come back next week, you can sit with me again. And the lady looks at her and she says, oh, for sure, we'll be back next week. And she turns and she leaves. And this young lady was in tears. And she would say to the other person that she was talking to about this, she said, that was amazing. That experience changed the way that I see church. And what was happening is that she was, she was actually making herself available for God to use. So, so there, there's something that can happen in all of our lives when, when you don't make yourself available for God to use you, if you just kind of attend church, after a while what ends up happening is you become a churched person. And speaking as a churched person, churched people have a tendency to just see what happens here on the weekend as something that is for us, like a bless me club. But never is your spiritual maturity determined more than when your focus gets upon other people. And never is that tested more than when you begin to serve others. And you begin to say, it's not about me. And God, let me pick up a wash basin and a towel. Let me begin to wash the feet of other people. Let me begin to serve others. This is the very heart of, of why Jesus came. In Matthew chapter 20, two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, they were arguing about who had the seats of greatest honor next to Jesus. And Jesus is, and the rest of the disciples are really put out by the whole discussion. And Jesus says to them, hey, you're thinking like a worldly leader. A worldly leader tries to determine how their leadership can actually benefit themselves. But he says, but among you, it will be or it should be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And then Jesus says this, he says, for even the son of man, he's talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, Jesus is saying this, you are never more like Jesus than when you are serving others. And so can I just ask you today, is there something that God is asking you to do and a lot like Moses you are hesitant because of your inability or your failures and God would just simply say man you're perfect because I can actually do extraordinary things through your ordinary and would you be willing just to step up and to serve him and we want to just help you with that on the card there's a way there's three big areas for you to serve in connections kids and students ministry and worship arts is that the only way that you can serve around here no those are three big areas that I would direct you to and some of you may say, well, I serve outside the church. I serve in the city. Man, that's fantastic. But, you know, you can do both, all right? And God may say, listen, I want to just ask you to, to be willing and available today to do what only I can do in and through you. Let me pray for us together today as we, as we commune with God and as we worship, and as we watch these baptisms. Father, we come to you right now, and I just pray that you might take our availability and do extraordinary things through it. God, please, as we maybe wrestle with you a little bit on what it is that you're calling each and every one of us to do, I just simply ask that you would give us the courage to just step forward and say, God, I, I, I'm, I just want to make a difference. And would you take my ordinary and do an extraordinary thing through it? Meet us in this place as we spend just some time reflecting upon this message and what it means for us. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, guys, this has been an amazing month, an amazing series to go through. I mean, we had, you know, last week we had so many of you sign up to give for the first time. The week before that, almost 2,000 of you signed up to be in a group for the first time. But the thing was that, and Aaron referenced it a second ago about baptisms, we had 140 baptisms across all campuses on the first week of this series. But here's the thing. We also had so many of you sign up and say, you know what, I'm ready to be baptized, but it didn't happen that week. And so what we're gonna do this week to celebrate this entire month and what God has been doing in and through this church, we're gonna celebrate by worshiping together and by watching some baptisms over there. So it's gonna be awesome, I'm so excited. And look, if you're here today and that's you and you signed up and said, man, I'm ready, or even if you're ready to do that today and you didn't sign the card that way, we're gonna open that tank, the invitation stands, okay? So I'm gonna pray for us. Why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet? We're gonna sing together, and we're gonna watch some baptisms. Father, we thank you so much, God, for who you are. We thank you for your love. God, we thank you for Jesus, and God, that he came to this world to set us free, to save us, and that he went to a cross, but God, it didn't end there. Three days later, he walked out of a tomb, and God, we celebrate that today, and as we sing, God, receive our praise. God, we love you and we celebrate with our brothers and sisters that are going all in today for you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
incredible weekend, amazing. Well, listen, we're gonna keep celebrating. There's some more baptisms going on. Look, there's still time. If you wanna get baptized, that tank is still open. Feel free to walk on out those doors right there, okay? Well, awesome. Hey, listen, before you go, just a quick reminder for you. Make sure you fill out the cards, drop them in the white boxes on your way out today, okay? And one last thing, all right? If you are a student or you have a student, on September 8th, that is our fall kickoff. All campuses right here. It's gonna be one big party, y'all, okay? Awesome, have a great week. We'll see you guys next weekend. By your spirit.